Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about reservoir routing at this point. And the reservoir routing, um, let's go to the next slide, uh, is, uh, is important for us because we're going to um, uh, use it not only uh, in the potential for a large scale, uh, uh, large reservoir that we might have to route through, but more importantly, this is going to be used a, a lot uh, whenever you have a, um, a small stormwater detention basin, you're going to have to understand how that, uh, how that system works. So let's uh, back up just a second and talk about flow routing in general. And uh, we have two major types that we'll, uh, we're not going to talk about all in class, but I want to make sure you, we discretize between the two differentiate between the two, and that's the streamflow river routing and reservoir routing. We're going to talk about this today. In lecture 36, uh, I discuss the streamflow river routing. And so what are we talking about when we talk about flow routing? It's a procedure to determine the hydrograph at a point on a water course from known or assumed hydrographs at one or more points upstream. So what are we saying there? If I've got a river system and the flow is in this direction, if I know the hydrograph at this location right here, uh, and if I draw that out, and this water is flowing past this point, by the time it gets down to here, that hydrograph is going to have a different look to it. And you'll notice it's broader, a little flatter here. This is uh, the routing process where the, and I, I will kind of discuss this in a few slides, but we want to know how does this change from this location down to this location uh, downstream. Now this is, I'm showing you as a stream system here, but let's say that I had a stream that went into a large reservoir. So let's just say that we had dammed this up here. So there's a big lake at the upper end or here. And so uh, essentially what we would have is water going into at the upper end of this river flowing into this large lake. What does it look like as it comes out the end down here uh, of this lake? And that's where we would have this element of reservoir routing. So there's differences here between the stream flow routing, which is an, you know, basically a stream that's flowing. There's discernible velocity throughout its length to a reservoir routing system where you have some velocity in the stream here, and then it hits this large lake system that's more like a big level uh, lake. And how does that, uh, that, hydrograph change from its inflow point to the outflow point here at the dam. So if I look at the Mississippi River, this is uh, the state of Illinois here. Illinois, if I could spell. This is Missouri. Over here is Kentucky. And so we have the Mississippi River that flows down from the north. This is the Missouri River system here that flows in just north of St. Louis. You have um, a location here, St. Louis. We have a USGS stream gauge on. Here is Chester, Illinois. That's another location for a stream gauge. And here is uh, a, a gauging station at Thebes, Illinois. This is the Ohio River. That uh, flows in here and it flows downstream and into the Mississippi River. And this goes on down to the Gulf of Mexico, you know, through, um, through a number of miles, hundreds of miles uh, on downstream. So if I look at the 1993 flood, there, there's data, this is the data from the 1993 flood. You can see that the Mississippi River at, at St. Louis is in blue here. So you can see this goes from roughly uh, late May of 93 through uh, September of 93. And you can see this is a long flood. And we had a lot of water here. This is at, at uh, St. Louis is in blue here. And then you've got the red is Chester and the green is Thebes. So the first thing you can see is when a particular peak happens at St. Louis, it's delayed uh, in it, its occurrence downstream. Here's Chester and here's Thebes. You can also notice that the, so there's a delay. You can see this flood wave moving through. It crests here at St. Louis before it hits uh, Chester and then Thebes. Same thing here at this secondary crest. Uh, we had this happen in the middle of July. And then uh, on August 1st, we had another crest at St. Louis. This was the uh, flood of record, actually. Flood of record and our St. Louis gauging station. And so you can see there's a tremendous difference 
here in the peak values, this is the process of a flood wave attenuating, as we call this attenuation. So not only does the peak delay because it's moving downstream, but also you can see it's lower. And, there, and, and this often happens yeah, between um, St. Louis and Chester and Thebes during this 1993 flood, there was no significant inflow coming in from any of these tributary streams. You've got the uh, Kaskaskia River that dumps in here. You've got the Merrimack that dumps in here. You've got the Big Muddy River. And those are the three bigger tributaries uh, to the Mississippi River between this stretch from St. Louis to Thebes. And they really weren't putting in any, any uh, substantial water at all. So you can see this attenuation is a natural process. So this slide here kind of talks a little bit about that. You've got this um, flood movement. So you've got the inflow and the outflow. So you've got this timing of the flood movement that you can see. Uh, if you look at the just the peaks as our time to flood movement, we've got some difference in terms of the, the timing between these flood peaks. You also have this translation and redistribution business that goes on. So if it was purely a translation, if I had a inflow hydrograph here and an outflow hydrograph, if it was purely an aspect of translation, the peaks would stay the same and the hydrograph would largely be the same uh, kind of look to it, you know, would have the same width and breadth. And, and so you can see that if, if it's a translation aspect, these are identical hydrographs. However, in the real world, we also have redistribution. So you can see here that the inflow hydrograph is, is in what I'm drawing in red. And as it moves downstream, not only does this crest flatten, but also the hydrograph stretches out. So the time from start to finish of this flood upstream is a lot uh, quicker than it is as the flood moves down, it, it broadens out. And this is just a natural process of flood waves as they move in a natural system. If you look at reservoirs, you can see the same kind of thing. This is a, uh, uh, a data from a detention uh, reservoir here. You've got a area of uh, a little over eight uh, square miles and you can see the inflow to that uh, uh, detention basin. Here's the outflow and this is in cubic meters per second. So you can see that the effect of this reservoir is to do the same thing uh, if the inflow hydrograph is right here, it does the same kind of thing with this attenuation and spreading out redistribution of the flood uh, wave uh, in the hydrograph. It does the same thing, only it does it over a shorter period, uh, shorter distance because this detention basin acts as a storage element. So if we look at, you know, some of the larger reservoirs, this is a Wapapello Reservoir, which is in southeast Missouri. You can see it was built in 1941. It was part of the uh, Mississippi uh, rivers uh, and tributaries project uh, brought on by the Corps of Engineers. After the 1927 flood, uh, there was a lot of action to try to figure out how to uh, never again have a large uh, Mississippi River flood. So uh, the Mississippi River and Tributaries project came about. It's mainly on the lower river below Cairo. And so one of the aspects of that project was in southeast Missouri, they went in and built this Wapapello Reservoir. It has a large, you know, over a million uh, acre feet of storage behind it. This is a 2,700 foot earthen embankment, height of 109 feet. And you can see that, you know, we've got this uh, emergency spillway over here. And we term it that because we don't want water going over an earthen embankment. That would, that would be uh, disastrous. It would uh, probably uh, cause it to erode and eventually fail and you'd have this big dam break flood. What we wanna do is we wanna make sure that this emergency spillway, which is built into the native uh, earth, um, the geologic strata, it can, if you have this major flood coming down into the Wapapello Reservoir, that anything that nature would throw its way in, this, in, the, in the way of uh, rainfall um, runoff, uh, that we could evacuate this reservoir safely without ever overtopping the flood or uh, overtopping the dam. And that's part of what we call the dam safety um, program. We have it in every state and th but this is a federal uh, levy. So the federal government maintains it, but it, it basically assures through hydrologic analysis that anything that comes in here by the way of of a major flood can pass 
true. Remember I talked in, in the precipitation lecture, the probable maximum precipitation of the PMP. That's again, if we wring out every bit of the potential moisture that could uh, accumulate in the atmosphere, what would that rain look like? And so the dam safety program, at least in the state of Missouri, says that you must pass 75% of the PMP if you model that into your reservoir, what that runoff look like, you have to size this emergency spillway such that it'll pass every bit of that. So if you look at Wapapella Reservoir, you can see that's 1300 square miles here, uh, encompasses all the way up into Farmington, Missouri. You can see Fredericktown. This is the Arcadia Valley here, which is a very lovely uh, area in the state of Missouri. And, you know, um, um, uh, basically elephant rocks is down in that area. So just to kind of orient you, um, if I pop out here and show you this emergency spillway, again, this is the dam over here that I showed you uh, earlier. This is the emergency spillway, which is 740 feet wide. You can see there's concrete abutment here, here, and they allow this water to come through um, when you have these major floods. In 2011, they were passing quite a bit of water over this. This did a lot of erosional damage uh, I, because they were putting so much water through this, uh, it, but that designed to, uh, that emergency spillway is designed to pass 200,000 cubic feet per second. There's some other dams around the state of Missouri. This is Bagnell Dam, which is a hydropower dam, and it's uh, it's not for flood control. And you can see it uses its tainter gates to pass everything um, that it, it needs to. Uh, I, I've not really studied this dam in great detail. I don't, uh, I've been over it. I don't see anywhere that you would have an emergency spillway. So I'm assuming, I've not looked at the analysis. I'm assuming that every bit of the, uh, the PMP is designed to pass through uh, the Tainer Gates here. This is the Osage River uh, that's, that's, it dams and the flow is obviously going this way. It comes out the Missouri River, uh, basically uh, just downstream of Jeff City. If you ever go from Rolla up to um, Jefferson City on 63, you'll cross the Osage River as uh, Highway 50 and 63 come together, they cross the Osage River. Um, this is quite a ways downstream from where the Bagnell Dam is. This is Lake of the Ozarks um, above it here. Getting closer to home, this is Burr One Park. So this is Burr One Park. And this is looking, this picture here is looking from, um, from 10th Street. And you can see that we've got the uh, Burr One Lake here and there's this earthen dam here. And over in this area is the emergency spillway. And you've got the regular, you know, sort of a water gets out here, it's embedded right in here, uh, if you walk across this dam, this is coming from 10th Street. I encourage you to go and walk across here. And then as you get over into this uh, native uh, strata over here, you'll notice there's a depression here, that's the emergency spillway. Obviously we don't want, want water going over to earth embankment, uh, that would be catastrophic and, and, and threaten the, the integrity of the dam, it would likely fail. So again, this is designed such that any of the uh, you know 75% of the PMP as it's modeled would pass through the emergency spillway. This is coming from the other side. So here's 10th Street right here. And this is looking back across the dam. You'll notice this is this depression that starts right in here. And, and again, it's in the, na it's in the uh, native geologic strata there. And so water would go through this without being going through this fill dirt. Uh, and causing a, a failure uh, problem here. So you can see kind of what this looks like. And I encourage you to walk this. Uh, the, the center uh, workout facilities here, part of the uh, Rolla Parks uh, and Recreation District. Um, so anyway, I, I encourage you to look it over. So as we look at what happens with a um, detention uh, pond or a lake like uh, Burwan Lake or whatever, um, you can see that the inflow comes in here at the upstream end. And then as it goes through the system, through the, the uh, outlet works, you get a totally different look to the hydrograph. This area right in here in crosshatch is the amount of storage that occurs. Now, when we have a stormwater detention program and you're the design engineer and you're going to urbanize an area, a lot of the stormwater uh, ordinances will require you to keep the uh, the native 
pre-development hydrology in place, which means that whatever the hydrograph looked like prior to any urbanization, that's what the hydrograph needs to look like post-urbanization or post-development. So this might be the post-development where you've got a much higher hydrograph. This might be the hydrograph that uh, would be a pre-development, which is what we're showing here. And the amount here between the difference between the two is what you've got for required storage in your detention basin. So that would be what you would have to look at trying to mimic the hydrology. You're going to build this detention basin to mimic that hydrology where you store it. Okay. And so this, this will be the outflow hydrograph here, or, you know, in this case, we also call it the pre-development peak flow rate uh, hydrograph is what we would have had. So we're trying to mimic that in the way that the hydrology would work. So, you know, when you urbanize an area, the peaks become bigger and they, they uh, peak quicker and they get rid of, they, the water comes on and off the watershed faster. And so you're trying to return the hydrology back to some pre-development um, look simply by building in a stormwater detention basin. This is a, an example of one. This is uh, up in uh, St. Charles County. This is in a, a town of St. Peter's. This is Ohms Road here, if you know where St. Charles Community College is. This is along Ohms Road where, where uh, uh, the uh, Mid Rivers Mall Drive and Ohms Road come together. And if you go back to the uh, west on Ohms Road, this is a, a stormwater detention basin that's built uh, in this urbanized area where you've built these houses you can see that there's, there's an inlet pipe here and an inlet pipe here. And then this is the outlet structure. And then you've got this earthen, you've got this earthen uh, dam right here that's built into. And so basically this is designed such that it dewaters everything, but it does so in a, a much slower method. It's, it's, it's meant to knock the peak off the, you know, the big peak off the urbanized hydrograph. And so it can still allow that water out. If you notice the top is a grate, it's open. And so they've, they've got some way that, you know, you can, well, not some way, but you can actually rate this, um, this opening uh, here. It's a keyhole. So you got a keyhole at the bottom, you know, kind of what the, um, the sort of like treated as an orifice. If you remember from fluid mechanics, we would have an orifice flow. And then these will be sharp crested weirs. So these will be weirs, weir flow. And so you could develop a, a, a rating relationship between elevation of water in this reservoir and what would be the outflow. So I'd have some sort of rating relationship between the outflow and the stage. Actually, let's draw it the other way, I guess. Well, no, it's okay. We'll, we'll, uh, yeah, no, let's do it that way. Flow and the stage. So the elevation in that, um, in that reservoir. If we looked at routing, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, we could um, we could do this through a full hydraulic routing, and this is something called the St. Venon equations. And we do do this at times, but this is much more complicated. It, you have to you have to have some sort of numerical model that would solve these uh, differential equations or 1D uh, partial differential equations. We will go, and, and what I'm going to teach you in, in the routing methods here, and we're going to get into reservoir routing, is we're going to use what's called hydrologic routing, which basically uh, has this hydrologic routing continuity equation, which says that the storage change, the change of storage, where S is equal to storage in the reservoir, uh, over time is equal to the inflow minus the outflow. So let's think about that a little bit. Uh, in, in a second. But first of all, if I've got some kind of situation, you can go to this YouTube video here and show kind of a flash flood. This would not be the kind of thing that I would use hydrologic routing. That is not going to work there. It's too dynamic, too, un too unsteady. We would have to use uh, full dynamic methods. 
and we would be using something on the order of this hydraulic routing, or we might even, this is in one dimension, I might even be uh, tempted to go to two to three dimensions. And also there's a, a lot of different complications here with, with sort of this wave front and a number of things that we'd have to worry about. So this is not the way we're gonna be talking about. Uh, you can go and look at this uh, flash, so it's kind of interesting on the YouTube video. Our reservoir routing is, is more like a bathtub. And so let's think of it that, let's say that you plugged up the bottom of the bathtub and turned on the faucet. So the outflow is equal to zero in this case. And so the inflow is the only thing we've got here. And that inflow would be the determinant on how the storage changes with respect to time. So as the inflow increases, you've got some storage change. The storage in the bathtub change with respect to time. And that's, it's in this case, if there's no outflow, that storage change is exactly going to be the inflow. So if you've got an inflow in, in cubic feet per second, you have a, a storage in terms of cubic feet per second, how, how that's changing. Now, if the water finally starts to overtop, you know, you fill this bathtub up, then the inflow is going to be equal to the outflow. And the storage, if it gets right to the top, it can't take any more, it is full. So the storage with respect to time, that's equal to zero at that point. So then we basically, whatever the outflow is, is gonna be whatever's running through the, uh, what is flowing into this area with the faucet on. So that's kind of a, the bathtub analogy is a, is a nice easy way to look at this uh, hydrologic continuity equation. Now, uh, as we, we go through and we uh, go further in this, we've got uh, our level pool routing method is simply going to uh, take advantage of this um, continuity equation. And so remember on differential calculus, we can just say that ds dt, we can, we can assume that's just some change of storage at time j plus one minus the, stor the storage at time j. So this is, in essence, what is this delta s, right? So this is a storage time j plus one minus the storage at the previous time step over the delta time, right? So this is ds dt is approximately equal to this uh, form here. And then if we wanna know what the inflow and the outflow term are, we're actually going to average it over that time step, right? Because we've got the, the inflow that was happening at the beginning of the time j and we've got the inflow that's happening at the end of the time, which is designated by J plus one. And we just add those together and divide by two. So we get an average inflow. Same thing with the average outflow. We get the, the outflow at time J, we get the outflow at time J plus one, and we divide by, add those together and divide by two. That becomes our um, outflow term. Now, what we're going to be after here is understanding this, J plus one time step. When we're doing our routing uh, using a level pool routing scheme, we know the times at J, right? That's the current time or the previous time step. What we're trying to do is know what's going on at the J plus one. Now, if I'm designing a, a stormwater detention basin, I'm going to know what that inflow hydrograph looks like. So I know the, the you know, I may do the, the unit hydrograph method like we've used. I put a rainfall onto that and I get some, some hydrograph inflow. So I know all the I's that's at the J plus one and the J. So I know everything there is to know uh, about, um, let's see if I can uh, get, get rid of the eraser here, erase all this. That way it's not, not filling this up. So now what I, I want to do, trying to pin that, is I want to know what this outflow is going to look like. And so I've got to uh, basically model this such that I can figure out the J plus one storage and the J plus one outflow, all right? And so again, as you look at this, we've got the inflow hydrograph, we've got the outflow hydrograph, the difference between the two is what's going on in terms of this is the storage in that time step. 
So that's just showing you graphically what's going on there. Now, if I further manipulate these equations, so this is the uh, ds dt is equal to i minus q, the inflow minus the outflow, okay? And so we've exploded that. I did that on the previous slide. Now let's um, take the delta t and take it to the other side. So we end up having sj plus one minus sj uh, equal to this business here. And I'm pointing out to you, the only unknowns we've got here are this J plus one uh, for the, the, Q, the outflow at the J plus one uh, time step and the storage at the J plus one time step. These are my two unknowns. So I'm gonna combine all my unknowns onto the left side of the equation. And this is going to be our, what we're calling their outflow storage function. We'll talk about that more in a second. So everything on the right side of this equation is known to me. Known, known as a start of the problem. Again, uh, even though this is at the J plus one time step, we know 100% of the inflow hydrograph. We do not know what the storage is at J plus one and the outflow at J plus one. Again, these subscripts here designate time. So this is the previous time J. This is the time that we're forecasting in the future J plus one. Now, um, this kind of slide just kind of reminds us of this. Uh, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to develop a relationship here between this uh, storage relation uh, and the outflow. And that's gonna be the key. And, and again, um, I'm gonna introduce this. The only way that you're really kind of, kind of totally understand this is to, to work through the example problem with me in class and also work the problems because that, you know, that's where it really kind of starts to cement in your head. And so in order to compute this, uh, the outflow at J plus one time step, we need a relation between this storage outflow function or the, the storage function, I guess is what we'll call this and the outflow. And we're gonna do that, we're gonna develop that. So let's talk about what we're what what some of the th things we need. This is a uh, reservoir in the state of California. This is actual out of an actual report that I pulled from the USGS. But this has the storage capacity. This is S, and this is my elevation. So the first thing you're going to do on one of these problems is you're going to build a relationship between storage, right here, and elevation. So if you go and you can here we've we've uh, done a bunch of cross sections here. And so we know the geometry of this reservoir and we can say, okay, well, at an elevation of 500 feet mean sea level, I go over here and I can see that um, the storage is uh, 1000 acre feet. Again, remember uh, volume is uh, length cubed. Um, we, you know, we've been thinking about that in terms of cubic feet, but I can also say that that's acre feet, right? Because an acre, has a length squared as its units and feet is a length. So now we've got length cubed. Again, one acre foot is one acre of land inundated by one foot. That's the way to think of, of the equivalent amount of storage that that represents. Now, besides the elevation uh, storage relation, we also need to develop an elevation versus discharge or outflow. And this is where your weir equations are going to come into play, you know, in, in lecture 19. Again, uh, going back to that uh, slide I had here, if we've got a outflow structure here, we can go through and analyze this and say, what is the flow if the elevation is at this level? Well, the only water that's going out is, is escaping this keyhole. And we just keep building a relationship. And then once we get out to this point, we've not only got water going out the keyhole, we've also got it uh, at the bottom. We've also got it uh, going out this slot at the top. We go up, now we're starting to engage this bigger weir here. And then once we get up to this elevation, we're pouring in the top. And so we have to combine all those three. We would come up with some relationship between elevation and the outflow. And that's what we're talking about here is developing this on this slide. You've got some means to do that. And, and again, if it's a weir, you've got the weir equations. There might be some other methodology you have to use in order to do that. For the, um, the Burr One Park example, 
we wouldn't be able to use the weir because that's a nice uh, long, even though it's steep, uh, slope to that grass embankment there going over that emergency spillway. In that particular case, I end up using HEC RAS to develop the uh, outflow hydrograph, uh, or the, the, the uh, stage versus ele uh, elevation, I'm sorry, the stage versus discharge hydrograph. So again, we have to have some way to come up with that. And you can see here, this is my elevation versus discharge curve. And these are examples, further examples. This is the one I showed you. These are some others. Here's the one from Berwan Park. This is another uh, uh, detention basin up in St. Peter's. This is one on uh, Lake of the Woods in uh, Muhammad, Illinois. Um, this is a, actually this one's from Muhammad. I can't remember where I, where I have this one, but you've got these various structures that you have uh, outlet works in. And so you'd have to rate those in some, some way. By rating that, I mean, I'm gonna get some value of elevation versus outflow. And so uh, this is what I mentioned about the, uh, the subcritical slope. We would actually use a HEC RAS and use step backwater modeling to get a, you know, elevation versus outflow here. But uh, uh, so what do we do with that? We're going to have the elevation versus storage and the elevation versus uh, uh, outflow. We're gonna combine that to get this thing called a storage function versus Q relation. And so here is my storage versus elevation relationship. Here is my outflow versus elevation relationship. So if I take the same elevation and I determine what the outflow is, I'm sorry, what the storage is, and I take that elevation and what is the outflow, Q, I can come up with a value and plot what the Q is. And now I take this storage S that I get from here, divide by delta T. Now the delta T is the time step in the, uh, routing model. I have to know what that is in order to develop this relationship. So again, uh, this is, until you actually see an example that I'm, I'm gonna show in class, it's a little harder to follow, but you need to kind of attempt this. I've actually recorded uh, from the spring of 2020, I have an example that I'm gonna post on onto Canvas that you can also look at as I work through the problem. I hope that you'll spend a lot of time on this to before you come to class because it will make working the problem in class a little more understandable, I think, as you see it again and again and you know what questions to ask to, to clarify any misunderstandings you might have. So again, I, I build a storage versus elevation model or relationship and I build an elevation versus discharge relationship. And then I go at various points of elevation and I pick off what the storage is and what the flow rate is, and I plot that. Here's flow rate versus, uh, I go and pick this storage value and then divide by delta T. Again, you've got to know that delta T value because you've got to know that ahead of time on your model. And, and we can, you know, you, we, we, I will give you the delta T on these uh, when you get a, a quiz problem on this. So you'll kind of know how to do this. This is uh, called the storage outflow function. This is the outflow. So I'm going to stop at this point and you can look further at the example that I give you uh, in class. And then I have one from uh, 2020 that I've, that I've recorded and I will post as well.